Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the channel. My name is Michael, and welcome back to my Carb Legal LS3 Wagon Swap Project. For those who are stopping by for the first time, make sure to check out all the earlier episodes in this whole build series, but let me do a quick recap of where we started. In the first episode, we laid out all of our parts and partners. In the second episode, we swapped in modern wheels and tires, modern sway bars, as well as an Eaton True Track limited slip rear differential. In episode three, we put in a set of Willwood D52 brake calipers. And then in episode four, we modernized and lowered the suspension using QA1 products, upper and lower control arms, as well as coilovers all the way around. And in part five, which you can see, we removed the engine, we painted the frame rails in the engine bay, and we installed a new Earl's Performance Vapor Guard fuel system. And now it's time to put the new LS3 Connect and Cruise E-Rod system back in here. But the one thing that we're gonna be doing kind of at the same time is we're gonna be working on the electrical system. And so what you can do is I pulled the chassis harness from this side, the passenger side of the body, there's a pass-through hole here. And so this is the wiring harness. Before I removed everything, I kind of labeled all the things that I wanted to keep. This is for the wipers. This is the fuel system. And this is the AC relay. You know, a lot of people just go ahead and just cut the wires off right here on these. And that is totally fine and probably a smarter thing to do. But what I've actually done is that I went and got some metal at the depot and cut myself a firewall block off cover. And then I'm gonna go ahead and drill a hole, use grommets to run the new wiring system through this block off plate and I got some padding for some insulation as well. So I think that'll look a little bit cleaner than having this old system kind of cut off. The other thing we did is that I went ahead and got the new accelerator pedal into position. So what's interesting about this, this is the, actually they call it the CTS V style accelerator pedal when you're looking around for brackets online and nobody makes anything for the B body as far as I can tell. So what I ended up doing actually is that I bought a bracket that someone on eBay makes for the 1973 to 1987 square body Chevys. So that fits exactly into place. And then I got these spacers to move it over a little bit. No drilling required. Uh, just right in the OEM position and as far as the bracket itself goes. So that worked out pretty well, I think. And here is our Connect and Cruise system as a whole. We've got the LS3 E-Rod. We've got the Holley 302-2 oil pan with this oil baffle system that they got in place. Basically, it keeps the oil right near the oil pickup tube. This is the F-body pan that goes under the oil. It's like the oil deflector pan plate. I forget what exactly what they call. I think some folks call them a windage tray, but I know this is also a windage tray. But my point is you get the F body pan, which is like 35 bucks brand new on Amazon. And then you have to make this notch per the instructions. There's a template in the instructions that come with Holly. Over here, we've got our torque converter and we've got the flywheel with the installation kit that is going to mount our 4L65 E transmission up to the back of the LS3. Over here, I went ahead and put on some more Earl's Performance fittings, one quarter NPT to 6AN line. Over here, fascinating enough. So the length of this uh, rod or linkage coming out of the transmission is different from the 4L60 that I was working on, but funny enough, the original hardware goes right onto it. So I'm gonna see if I can get that to work. That's what this is, the original kind of shift linkage. Here's the engine control harness. Here's the Holly mid-mount accessory drive system, which we're gonna do on all of these things have instructions and you should all read, 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 read the instructions because I'm not gonna cover everything nor should you follow me because this is also my first time. Wish me luck. All right, guys, update and a little bit of progress here. I put it on so that the Flex plate and torque converter hole was here in the starter position. And then I was able to get the transmission into place. There's three more bolts that torque to, I believe 37 foot pounds that go into the torque converter from the flex plate. Now we're good to go as far as that goes. And I need to get all the rest of the connections for the bell housing here onto the back of the engine and all torque to 37 foot pounds. This is the oil pan that comes with the LS3 E-Rod Connect and Cruise. So we're swapping it out for the Holly oil pan. This is the Holly pickup tube that's gonna go down into the Holly pan. We're gonna make sure that there's no clearance issues with the crank. And then we got an OEM gasket. All right, guys, we've got our new oil pan installed. There is the name, Holly. Thank you guys for being our partners on this build. We got the bolts over here. 
We got the back bolts from the transmission. The thing about the oil pans and LS engines, you probably know this, but they are a structural component, so it's imperative that everything is lined up. Torque to spec. All right, success on the driver's side. Let me walk you guys through. Oil dipstick is in the way, and you've got to get your coil plugs out of the way as well. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, push in, lift up a touch, and then pull them both out. All right, pop that loose. Here we go. Manifold side, and there's a down arrow, so you get it right. Get that started. These are all 13s. Directions say tighten and torque from the inside out. There's gonna be two torque passes. The first one is 11 foot-pounds, and the second is 15. Quick update over here, I forgot that I had gotten the Holly LS swap dipstick tube. You see, instead of mounting over here, it mounts over here and it just drops right in. Oh, and up front here, we went ahead and put the new hub assembly in. This was a bit of a challenge. You need to get a torque wrench that can go up to 250 foot pounds. And I didn't want to buy one, so I was lucky. The guys over at South Bay 4x4 hooked me up with a loaner and we got everything torqued to spec. Basically, you put in the old bolt, torque that to 240, take it off, and then torque this one to, I think it's 59 foot pounds, whatever's in the instructions. Update, now this is on. And the last thing we need to do to get this crank bolt secured properly is rotate it 120 degrees. By the way, you guys, for the entire Holly mid-mount system, they have a couple great videos on their website. Highly recommend. All right, now our lower pulley is on. So now we're gonna go ahead and take off the OEM water pump assembly. And here is the heart of the Holly mid-mount accessory drive system. It's more of a water pump housing in a bracketing system, but this is actually your water pump. It's a cartridge style water pump. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna install the supplied gasket, put this on, line up the holes, get this into place. And if you ever have a water pump failure, you don't need to take apart the whole front of the car. You can just swap out your cartridge. And another thing that's neat about this system is that built into the back is your steam port. That's right, you don't have to run your steam line all the way from the engine block over to your radiator, adding more hosing, adding more clutter. All right, cartridge installed and torque to spec. We got our six M8 bolts in here. This one here in the back is the short one. And now we're on the engine. All six bolts are torqued to 18 foot pounds. All right, and the other quick thing that I did is that I put some fiberglass aluminum reflective material here where my downpipes, the cats are gonna be. All right guys, update for you. Unfortunately, I had a kind of a massive delay while I was doing the engine install portion. I made a mistake trying to get some clearance room for the passenger side header down here, and I ended up trying to shim the engine. And in the process of doing that, I was moving the motor mount around, and I ended up starting to damage the threads that are inside the engine block. Completely my fault, but I was very, very lucky. I ended up stopping, asking for help. I found an amazing guy named Jim. The business name is Jim's Tap Extracting in Gardenia, California. So I ended up taking the motor and transmission back out, disconnecting the transmission, taking the engine over to Jim's shop where he was able to examine the threads. Now, if I had caused major damage, he would have had to put inserts into them, but I was very, very fortunate. He was able to fix them in about 10 minutes and amazingly, he refused to take any payment. So thank you, Jim. You really saved my butt. Which brings me to a small tangent about gratitude and the car community as a whole. Not only am I thankful for my project partners like Dakota Digital, Guarantee Chevrolet, Holly, and Magnaflow, but a huge shout out also to all of our members over on ls1tech.com. Thank you guys for all of your support with this build. And lastly, a massive non-sponsored shout out to all of my local AutoZone, O'Reilly's, Napa, my local hardware store. All of the folks there helped me find bolts and parts and hoses and all sorts of things that shouldn't go on this car, but they were able to help me complete my build and they were always asking about it. So thank you to all of those folks as well. And because I've been so lucky with parts and partners in the community, I wanted to find a way to pay it forward as well. So I gave my 1992 TBI drivetrain to 
another Roadmaster wagon owner. I had it listed for sale on Facebook Marketplace, needed to get it out of the garage, and of course, the lowballer showed up. Oh hey, can I have that for like $100? Is that okay? And then a guy named Chris reached out to me. Here's Chris standing next to his grandmother. This photo was taken a few years ago, but you can see his wagon in the background. Chris had the misfortune of taking his wagon to a mechanic who misdiagnosed a problem with the engine. The shop that I had the wagon in just completely butchered the motor. They took it apart and they tried to figure out what was making the sound. And I show up and I show them the flywheel with a crack in it. And then they said, oh, well, we'll put it back together. And it did look like this. I've been literally looking for this specific engine for the past five years. Either one didn't run or it was rusty or they would sell it. And so when Chris said to me that he was gonna drive all the way from Texas to California to buy my engine, I knew I had to give it away to him for free. It's just amazing to find this motor and, and to be able to get my Roadmaster back up and running. At the same time, Chemical Guys generously hooked Chris up with some sweet car cleaning products to help get that wagon looking great when he gets it back on the road. My grandson's gonna love this. He's gonna love the car wash at home. Best of luck to you, Chris. I cannot wait to see your wagon running and driving again. After taking a little bit of break, waiting for some parts, the engine and transmission are back in. Everything is now secure in terms of the engine mounts. I ended up making some more room kind of on the frame side and on the piping side, so I didn't actually have to do any shimming. Over on this side, you guys, you will see we've also got the, the transmission cross member into position here. The other exciting news that you guys are gonna notice is the drive shaft is back in place. Now, I went with a company called Drivelines Incorporated, paid full price, no sponsorship there in Orange County, California. So if you're in the Los Angeles area, Orange County, they come directly to you. They measure the drive shaft, what you have, what you need, we ended up revising the original one, so they, I think they changed the length and they put new joints on the front and the back there. I could have gotten a full sleeve for about a hundred bucks more, but they said that this was going to be good for the amount of power that we'll be running with this LS3 setup at 430 horsepower, so I'm super stoked to have the driveline back in. Oh, the other thing that I did is that I made a hole here. This is where you're going to run your OBD2 port, the throttle pedal connections, and a few other wires, check engine light. They all run off of this part of the harness. And I made a little extra clearancing room over here for the heater core. I guess this these motor mounts sit a little bit higher than some. I might need to move this coil eventually, but I'm gonna try to kind of snake the hoses around here so that I don't. Now it's time to get accessorizing. All right, guys, a little hang up here. So this is one of the two hoses that I got to go with the Borgson unit. Unfortunately, with the angle of how this hose is pre-made, it's too thick to kind of tuck in underneath the alternator. So what I decided to do was I'll just go to a shop and have them cut the proper end off this hose and make me a fitting. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have to put this into place. And before I put the pulley on, I'm gonna try to get a measurement of how much line I need to fit to the power steering box. So let's get this into place. All right, you guys, and success. Ended up spending a couple hours going to get some parts. To, um, here's some just first impressions about the Holly mid-mount system here. As you can see, it's everything's really, really tucked in here. Other mounting systems, you have trouble clearing the ABS module right here. And of course, as you can see, the Holly system fits perfectly. So this was my ultimate goal here, and everything is nice and tight. There's gonna be room for hoses and other accessories. So that's a big, big thumbs up for my end. The only thing that's a little bit of a challenge to remove the alternator in the future you're going to have to get the water pump out of the way this pulley is right in front of the lower mounting point and then the compressor both of these bolts mount from the back and as you can see there's very little room on ls style engines to get to this one and make sure that you torque it properly so you know just a kind of a couple things to keep in mind that it might be a little bit more challenging to replace these components if they should fail in the future the other thing that i would recommend is that i ended up getting this hose kind of custom built for the high pressure side the thing i would recommend is having your power steering lines on the power steering box if you're working on a b-body because it's very hard to get in to here once the power steering pump and the reservoir are then installed so yeah that's it for the install of the engine and the holly mid-mount accessory kit very excited to take the next step we got to put the cooling in we got to put the bumper back on 
We gotta start buying some hoses and this and that. We gotta do the EVAP system. Yeah, moving along. All right, folks, many updates for you. First, let's go under the car to show you what I've been dealing with and what I have to deal with. So, as you can see, my catted downpipes are hanging a little bit low, so we'll have to make some type of adjustment there that doesn't change the position of the cats themselves. Anyway, I'm gonna have a pro do it and stay super legal. First issue that I had to deal with, you guys, is that it turns out the yoke was leaking on my brand new drive shaft. So I called up the company that made that and they serviced it under warranty, but yeah, that was a big disappointment. Also, I learned that I'd put the wrong barb on this end of the fuel filter, which was totally my mistake. I had just ordered a bunch of parts from Holly and I used the wrong one. Anyway, used the right barb and uh, now this no longer leaks. And the great news is, of course, is that my fuel pump definitely works, but I don't have power to it from the ECU yet, which is something we have to fix. Okay, going backwards, try not to scrape my head. Ah, pipes. Another issue that I've been chasing is these fittings right here. This is, like I said, the Borgensen steering box and I got the Borgensen hose kit and had to make it, had to get it shortened to go up here to the Holly power steering pump. But unfortunately the fittings that Borgensen supplies, you have to put a brass adapter into them. And no matter what I did, they just kept leaking. So I went back to the OEM GM style, basically the same fittings from my 92. In fact, this hose here is from my 92 Roadmasters. Put that in, not leaking. This one, I had it custom made with the 6AN line that goes to the Holly and over here to back to the original GM style and it is no longer leaking, so that is good there. Up here, you will notice that my starter is out and the reason for that is that when I hooked up everything with the battery, I put these heat shields in for the transmission lines to kind of mimic what they did here with the knock sensor. There's not much room in here between the header and so forth and it started arcing on the post for the starter. So what I've got is another heat shield this blanket to go around the starter. And hopefully, as you can see in here, it'll kind of cover up the post in there and we'll be kind of good to go. Other leaks we were chasing is that, so right now you guys, I've got oil in the engine. We've got transmission fluid in the transmission, power steering fluid in the power steering pump and reservoir. Every time I added a new fluid, I found another leak and as I've been trying to describe, some of them have my fault, some of them have been not necessarily my fault. For example, my biggest leak was actually from the thermostat housing here on the Holly Midmount accessory kit. I couldn't really fathom what I had done wrong. And the problem that I had is that I couldn't get to the thermostat housing, at least with the tools that I have, without removing this idler arm pulley right here. The issue with the leak at the thermostat housing was actually the thermostat that Holly provided. And I don't know if you guys will be able to see this on camera. The fitment isn't great. You see how there's just, there's just the smallest kind of hole right there. I think fluid was just kind of pouring out. I got the thermostat that was included with the LS3 crate motor GM OEM part. Leak check. No more coolant leak as well. So I'm very excited about that. So it's basically just been patching all these gremlins. And of course, apologies for the wiring. I'm gonna put some loom on these things here. I had a gentleman helping me and this is just kind of mocked up to see if we can get the system running. Oh, initially I had put all the positives here to the GM fuse relay box. But what I realized is that their pos terminal here is only 50 amps. And basically the whole car used to run off a junction box, which you can see right here. And I figured that's gonna pull more than 50 amps. This is gonna what runs the entire interior of the car and everything like that, because 92s didn't have a fuse box under the hood. So this is all very important. And it used to sit right here. And so I'm just gonna find another place to put it here. And then, so this here is the fuel pump wire. The issue I'm having is that I know my fuel pump works because I jumped this side of it. This is the thicker gray line that goes all the way back to the fuel pump and it used to be connected to the fuel pump relay that used to be right over here. So right now I'm not getting power right here and I've read that could be because of grounds. So I've got the two ground straps over here on the back of this cylinder head and I've got the third one back here, but it's mounted also to this transmission dips tube. So as I'm doing the starter replacement, I'm gonna go ahead and put the ground to its own bolt on the back of the cylinder head, see if that makes any difference and see if we start to get a 12 volt signal here because I think 12 volt signal here is the only thing I need to get this thing started. So we're pretty close. This is all the wiring that's gonna go to the air conditioning system. Apologies for the rat's nets. I just wanted to see if I could get things running before I make them pretty. But basically, this is the low pressure switch. It goes right in here. And then per the wiring diagram, it follows this wire all the way out over to this connector here, which used to be connected to the high pressure switch that was on the original R4 compressor. Since we've got this newer style that doesn't have a built-in high pressure switch, I got a trinary switch from Vintage Air. And so this switch, which will be used to monitor for high pressures. If it's high pressures, boom, 
the switch will cut out and the compressor won't run so we won't blow up the entire system. So I'm gonna have help with this for my air conditioning guy who's gonna make me the custom lines that'll go over here to the compressor and over to my condenser, which is the original one. This overflow coolant tank from 94 to 96 Roadmasters is working out great so far. I've been filling the system from here. The only thing I need to do is I need to put one more bolt right here into this section to keep it just a little bit more sturdy. You see it's like wiggling around there because the original 92s only had the two bolt down locations and this has a third. And then I haven't bolted down the computers yet. They're going to be sitting in these general areas, but I just have them here. Like I said, I wanna get this running. You wanna get it warmed up to temperature the first time and then I'm gonna tie everything down and start making things pretty and looming and, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, yeah, here we go. And so after its first start, the wagon has actually never let me down. It started every single time. But there was one small worry from the beginning, a slight damper vibration at idle that goes away at higher RPMs. So after rechecking my work and retorquing everything on the damper, I brought the wagon over to American Heritage Performance. They're a high-end Corvette race shop in Harbor City, California, and they went ahead and double-checked my work. The great news is that they confirmed that my install was correct all along. They also swapped in an ARP bolt, but alas, the vibration continued. Still, given the fact that it's minor in nature, after talking to both American Heritage Performance, after talking to the LS Swap guru who you may know on YouTube, everybody said just to enjoy the engine and not to worry. All right, here we go, maiden voyage. Now I've got kind of everything tucked away temporarily so we can do the break-in drives. Oh, I'm terrified, let's see how this goes. Here we go, firing it up and then we're gonna let it warm up before pulling out. Sounds good. That's it for this video, folks. I hope you really liked it. If you did, please consider giving us a like or a subscribe. If you're on racingjunk.com or ls1tech.com, please join our forums, join the discussion there. We'd really like to hear from you. And stay tuned for the next episode. I think you're gonna wink like the sound of that. We're heading down to Magnaflow HQ in Oceanside, California. They're gonna put an exhaust on it and we're gonna document the whole process and do some sound testing. But see you next time.